something about seeing the earth from so far away that just changed your perspective like actually seeing it we no matter how many things are happening space is definitely the one thing that is always on my mind so what about your human life are you like everyone else you hate <laughs> uh, so with these three phases you can go anywhere in the, in the solar system or dare say in the universe and you, you can put humans there successfully reliably you have to understand the house the, the the issue that we're facing now mm -hmm. on this planet before of course we take yeah. the issue to other planets or the most critical thing to understand is that whatever we do for space it always helps Earth because it's quite a uh, a high-ranking official in the government industry and he was like look all the benefits that you would get geographically politically speaking um in terms of launching a rocket or heavy infrastructure this probably gets much outweighed by the amount of red tape uh, there is in this country. That's, that was one of the primary concerns that, you know, we talk about in the young generation. It's like, we're already so far behind in technology. Now you give American companies the benefit that Australian companies have. Well, now we're completely useless. <laughs>
someone at the age of 20 yeah. who has all of these dreams and is really focused mm -hmm. and he wants to achieve and it's all about science technology what about your human life are you like everyone else your age <laughs> uh sort of i mean i don't drink i don't party much i'm mostly in work but I think every young person has a very, very common, common trait. They're all ambitious, or at least most of them are. So I think I, I do fit into the norm in that sense. Um, I guess I just work more hours than other people do. I think that, I think that's genuinely the only difference. And a lot of young people who are ambitious don't know where to put their ambition. You know, there's so many things you can do. I've just chosen something and I'm just, you know, running with it, try, trying to build up the space industry. And yeah, so there's only, it's only basically those two differences that make me that make me different so hopefully i'm a human i mean as far as i know well I'm, I'm doubting so <laughs> but I'm to tell, we'll find out down the track <laughs> yeah but tell me something so what did you do at school did uh as in my hsc your hsc yeah. i did what did i do i did maths in initially i did extension one math extension one english and then advanced math so advanced were you a english. top student always or no. not really uh oh, always in primary i wasn't the smartest I was sort of, I was, because I'll tell you what, I wouldn't really pay attention in class, but because I had tutoring outside at times, I would, I would understand enough to make me pass. So, but if I would have put in more effort, I think I would have been a top student um, in high school, that is. In primary school, yeah, I was all right. I think, I don't know, I wasn't really a marks kid, right? Like, I, I never prepared for exams, like, because I was always interested in other things, you know, one day I'd be... What other things about quantum science? <laughs> and... <laughs> well, what when I was in grade three and four, I was learning French, right? Um, I was swimming, golfing, I was doing all these sports. Like, so you are normal. Yeah. Like oh. human, like everyone else. Well, fingers crossed, right? But, <laughs> but I mean, my, my, I was always, I was interested in everything, you know, so studies was just another thing that was just like, you know, you have to do it. So I would so you went it. to selective school, you told me. And... Yeah. Yeah. So my, my high school was Gosford Selective High. Um, great place to be. I'm not sure how it is now, but when, when I was there, um, it was very sport focused as well. Right. So, um, so it's not really stressful to go to selective schools. Oh well, it is. I mean, it. I guess it depends which one you go to. Um, mm. in, in my one, there were sort of like two groups. There were, you know, the people who were really relaxed, just doing what they want to do in life, who were smart enough, but they didn't want to pursue that. Um, then there were other people who were, you know, gunning to be a doctor, or lawyer, engineer. You know, so it was like fifty-fifty. It depends which group you associated yourself with. Okay. Yeah. So you, and then you jump to uni, uni doing uh, your computer science, Yeah. but you're not limited to computer science. I've read your CV. <laughs> I'm not sure how much yeah. it's true, but yeah. you're doing a lot of, uh, I don't know, something in financial. Uh, yes. yes some I... financial, something in construction. Yes. Uh, so... You jumped on an Ericsson project and uh, yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. So look with, with me, I think that's a key thing with me. I think in a very abstract way, like there's no line for me that makes sense. There's no path that's correct with me. I try and do as many things as I can. Or I think in the simplest way, whatever thing comes in front of me, I just start doing that. And it just happens to be at those particular times. Um, I, I got into construction and, and managing construction projects. I just had that opportunity. So I, I just said, yes. Right. Uh, at the time, there was a thing happening with Ericsson, but they were trying to make an algorithm. And I just I just happened to come across the information. Um, so I applied and and the next thing you know, I'm developing an algorithm. Um, so uh, once again, I think it's just whatever comes in front of well, whatever opportunity you have, learn to say yes. Think about how you're going to do it later. So this is your message to the new kids, like the new generation. Just 100%. grab any opportunity you can. 100% and run with it, build on it, and also make the most of it. A lot of people these days, they half-ass things. I think if you genuinely, it, no matter how small the opportunity is, if you grab it and you make them, like genuinely make the most of it, I mean, put in like 12-hour days, 13-hour days, consistently show you're making progress. Um, I think what happens is the people you work with will notice that your superiors will will notice that and i think that really poises you for success of every um everyone else okay so are, are you focused do you know like who where you're gonna end up or you're trying in our different fields right uh do i know where i'm gonna end up yes that's space like my my no matter how many things are happening 
space is definitely the one thing that is always on my mind. So um, whatever it is I'm going to end up doing will be in the aerospace industry, particularly because the import the importance of it in 20, 30, 40 years is just going to be absolutely astronomical, right? Like if you if you think about all of the current world problems, right, such as the e energy crisis, resources, climate change, all of the solutions we currently have are limited to Earth, right? So, so, so no matter how many new policies you make, no matter how many batteries you make, no matter, uh, no matter what new technology you bring, you're consuming resources from Earth, right? You, you can really only avoid or restrict climate change if you're taking resources from not Earth. So basically Mars, um, there's an asteroid belt beyond Mars, as well as moons. We have a significant amount of moons here on Mars and on, on Jupiter. Which is actually the second project that um, that we did is that we built a prototype for a submersible on that was meant to go into Europa. Europa's um, a moon, and it's f like has a thick shell of ice. At some places, it's like fifteen kilometers thick. Some places, roughly three. Um, but it was meant to melt the ice, go down, and look around and test the water. Just think about it. It's a whole planet with uh, well, moon with fresh water. Right. So it's um, so I think at the core, what we're doing is we're trying to make change and I'm finding whatever opportunities I can along the way. So how did you get this um, this passion um, for space? Where, where did it all start? Oh, man, um, I think I was young. Uh, I was young and my dad was talking about, yeah, humans have gone to the moon. I think I may have been like four or five and I'm like, pause. <laughs> go back we've gone to the moon he's like yeah and then i'm like and then what and he goes and then we stopped and that made no sense to me as a kid i i couldn't i think like you achieve something so big so grand and now you tell me 60 or 40 years later we we have nothing he's like yeah pretty much so i was like um and then after that you know the normal um talking with friends also every child who you see you ask them oh well, what career you want to be almost everyone said i want to be an astronaut so i think we can all agree it's a pretty cool career yeah, well these days they're more <laughs> soccer players or yeah. rugby league players or probably, probably. maybe uh i don't know a tradie or just a, yeah don't really yeah. light yeah maybe but i mean in, in my time one of the big things i want to be an astronaut you know everyone said that in preschool at least once so i think it, it, it was also <laughs> there was a tiny bit of competition between the five-year-olds to become an astronaut. So I think I just wanted to be at the front of that. And that just led me to research. So you've met one, yeah? You've met an astronaut? Yes, yes, I have. I think I was, oh man, 2018, I think I was. I was at NASA in Houston. I had tried their um, Mars rover simulators and you know took a tour of the facility, met an astronaut, got to talk a bit. It wasn't very long, but I think 10, 15 minutes, got to talk with an astronaut. And I think that was a final nail in the coffin. I was just, I was hooked. You know, okay. to space. So what really attracted you? I think... Like the look, skills, the knowledge, the, um, I don't know, their life? Honestly... Do they have a life? <laughs> yeah. In, astronauts? Surprisingly, they're very humble people. Oh, oh, a oh, lot of imagine, astronauts. Yeah. 100%. Like, you can, you can speak to them in a very genuine and direct way. It's not like, oh, I'm an astronaut. Because I think there's something about seeing the Earth from so far away that just change your perspective, like actually seeing it. We've all seen pictures, right? But until you experience it, that, you know, all of the financial markets, all of the happiness, the pain, all of the growth, all of all of whatever humans know to be is limited to just this place. And outside is complete silence. So I think that makes them quite humble. Um, but when you ask me what attracted me to it, I think it was the, the grandness. You know, because when you're when you're that young, you aren't that smart to understand, you know, skills or or the progress they're making at a deep level. So I think what attracted me was like the grandness. You know, you would see just miles and miles of concrete pads, and you know, rockets. And when when we walked in, we saw like the Atlantis hanging from the roof, and like the entire just one engine was just like twenty times my size. You know, and I think it was just, there was just something about that, and I was like, you know whatever i do i have to do this because everything just seems small small in front of it you know so would you say um would you dream like one day that you will see the earth from the top would you be just 
Or yeah, sort of. Really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, once sometimes it was from the Earth, sometimes in the Moon. Sometimes I'm like, hmm, what would it actually be like on Mars? Now we have a big push towards Mars. Um, personally, I think that's good, but I think we're skipping a step, which is the Moon. I think um, if if you were to make a transit hub on the Moon, you would save a lot of resources, um, a lot of pain. You know, uh, taking all of your resources. Of course, you'd have to take it up to the Moon somehow. But I feel like if you were to have a native production facility development, um, then that makes things a lot easier, which is which is why we're working on, you know, lunar and Martian concrete. Um, because obviously, if you want to build in space, you want to build structures, one of the only things that suits is concrete, um, especially because you can mine it and form and use the ice melted down and then get concrete forms so that um, so that way you can have actual habitats being built from the actual soil of the place. I think NASA recently tried it with Mars, the prototype Martian habitat with a 3D printed concrete. We're trying to do a similar thing, but we're trying to work with like forms, like actual um, formed concrete, um, concrete piles and mostly autonomous building as well. Because, you know, you can't have 30 tradies on the moon just you know, hitting nails and banging away. So a lot of it's going to have to be autonomous. So, um, but it's these things combined that I think I've been thinking about for a long time. Maybe even sometimes dream about, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because um, there's only so many hours in a day. Okay. So the reason I'm, well, the reason I get in touch with you is because someone else recommended you yeah. and told me, man, you have to meet this young yeah. guy. He's really fascinating. He's doing an amazing work mm. in um to do construction in Ma on mars yeah and then when i sat down with you you explained to me clearly that there's like three phases to for one you have to transport to yeah. reach mars and then how to eat on mars and then what do you have to construct on mars yes uh, construct and basically heavy infrastructure like yeah. like uh, transportation because a lot of people there's a huge push towards um especially from the canadian and european side to you know find systems that can mine the moon and mars Right? But if you look at the actual mining infrastructure on Earth, right, you mine it, you transport it, and then you, uh, then you refine it and then send it out. So we're meeting, missing a big piece of the puzzle, which is transportation. Because right? if you just mine and process at, at, on one particular vessel or at one particular place, there's your, your output's very restricted. Right? So you need some form of transportation. That's either tr train or that's either truck. Trucks are going to be hard on, on Mars and Moon. So I think a, a train system or something similar is you, you're going to have to need it um, in order to actually mine productively and to also construct, which is the third phase. Um, and But the, obviously the three so elements... Construction is your main focus, yeah? That's... Um, well, for, for the company, there are, there are three main focuses. One is obviously the heavy infrastructure, which is the rockets sending, uh, sending equipment up there. That's the first stage. Second stage is the, the, um, life critical systems, uh, which we need, such as breathing, eating, farming. These things are mostly known already and you can create them within a facility. But for that facility, you need a construction place or a, like an actual con con construction production line which is the third phase, and that's what we're working on currently. Um, and with these three phases, you can go anywhere in the, in the solar system, or dare say in the universe, and you, you can put humans there successfully, reliably, and you can, you can increase humanity's capability, which is, mind you, something that a lot of people overlook. You, know, you see the, a lot of the current companies right now, like let's say SpaceX, oh, we're space exploration, but they've only done work in rockets. Right. They like if you ask them, have you done like maybe it's top secret? We yeah. don't know. But most of their innovation is in rockets, which is great. But it's like, what about phase two and three? Because because you need these two, two things, you know, yeah. and they're already planning. OK, we're going to get something to the moon. I think last time I read it was 2030. Maybe that's changed. But it's like, OK, so are we are we going to start thinking about this after how we construct and, and how we build in moon and Mars after this? Or should we be doing this before? Right. And the answer is obviously before. So a lot of the large, you know, exploration companies are simply just taxi companies right now for satellite, which is fair enough because you have to be commercially viable. But we're thinking about all aspects and trying to, you know, work on all fronts where, okay, we have rockets. How do we commercialize that? All rocket engines. Um, we have our life critical systems. Great. You, you 
don't really need to commercialize that because that's for when you are there. But then now we're focusing on the third frontier, which is okay. How how do you get housing or mass housing exactly construction yeah. and all these things? But um, which not many people seem to be thinking about. Maybe just NASA. So again, when um, <laughs> when they mentioned your name and they mm. sold me your ideas, uh, someone is young. Um, young student is who's trying to solve mm. the housing on Mars. Yeah. And the first thing that got through to, through my mind straight away is why is he solving the housing on Mars? <laughs> and he can't solve the housing in Australia. Yeah. Housing issue in Australia. Yeah. So if we go back to Earth, Earth which is yeah. like where we live now. <laughs> yes, um, thankfully. It's a very so, nice place. How do you see the issue of housing in Australia? I think, um, like, do you, yeah. uh, do you have to, do you have to understand the house, the, the, the issue that we're facing now mm -hmm. on this planet before of course. we take yeah. the issue to other planets or how does it work? Of course. Well, I think like one thing to point out that a lot of people may not realize that space has always helped earth, right? Like these phone devices, probably what people are watching this on now or tablet or computers, uh, these have systems that were developed for the, the mission to the moon back in the in the late 1960s early 1970s ram like ram came the concept of it came from nasa for space if it wasn't for that we wouldn't have any of this technology we wouldn't have mics cameras lights any of these right so i think it's first the most critical thing to understand is that whatever we do for space it always helps earth because it's it's technology our aim is to always commercialize it because that's the point of a company and and also, I think innovation is necessary in every field, especially speaking from an Australian standpoint, um, where we are falling behind in some areas quite fast uh, as compared to, you know, BRICS, um, USA, Europe. Now, coming, uh, moving forward to your housing crisis issue, as I think I've said this before, it's not a housing crisis issue, it's a transportation issue, right? Which is also the one of the phases um, which I which I explained that you, you need to transport your mining materials for Mars. Transport is a very big issue because if you were, uh, hypothetically speaking, well, let's say anything's possible, we build a high-speed railway. And I'm talking an actual high-speed railway, which has four large points from here to, let's say, Newcastle and here to, let's say, Wollongong, right? What you would have is suddenly people who are commuting an hour a day from, let's say, Hornsby to the city, right? Now, um, in that same time frame they're commuting, be able to reach all the way out to Wollongong or Newcastle. So that means they'll be willing to live much further out, right? So that's your first, like your problem's almost already solved there. If you make a yeah, high maybe speed... Maybe that was ahead. a valid point before COVID because after COVID, it's mm. all working from home and yeah. not a lot of people actually travel anymore. Exactly. Got to work. So, I mean, half of your house... But we're still crisis. having a housing issue. Yeah. And, you know, I genuinely think the core issue there is the, tr the transportation issue, right? Because, yes, we have the metro building. Great, right? Now, and everywhere the metro has gone, housing prices have what? They've skyrocketed because they know it's going to be convenient, it's going to be faster, and which is why people are willing to move all the way up to Talawong and even past that because they know this. you can connect to the city on the days you're not working from home. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I think if you were to genuinely focus on a high speed railway project, right, because here's the thing, the government's already spending billions of dollars, right? We have like a new tunnel built every five years, right? Which and they always get it wrong. Always <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah. And it always costs tolls, right? So 100%. expensive, right? Why wouldn't you just reroute that funding to high speed railway? Because now people will be able to build, you know, what's right now, what's four hours away. Land's cheap. Construction materials would be cheap. We have a huge construction industry, right? Construction people are smart. So it's, I think the only redundancy here is transportation because where you have access, you have growth, where you have growth. And once that growth starts spreading out, right, that's what brings all the prices down. Because now demand isn't only for these places where infrastructure is available, right? Mm. So you're like, everyone goes, oh, we have a housing crisis. With all due respect, it's up transportation crisis and if we actually worked on it and fixed it i think within two to three years you would see all the housing prices come down because now suddenly not everybody wants to be in the city people happy to spread out towards newcastle or to wollongong now that being said other option is if you don't want to build out then you build up right we have a lot of heritage listed places now i get it heritage country culture all that but i think if it's genuinely costing people 
people their livelihood, I think we should look at a lot more high-rise infrastructures, which once again stems from construction. Right? Also something we're working on. Yeah, it's too hard for the Australian society to absorb that, man. It's just high-rises <laughs> and there's a lot of people around them that just yeah. freak out. Yeah, I mean, they need their space. I, I mean, yeah, it's true. An, it's an empty continent. So that's how it is. <laughs> yeah, so here you go. If if the people need space, then it's then it's high high speed railway. If people are willing to live in apartments, like let's say Dubai, right? They have the Burj Khalifa. They have all these huge buildings, right? Or let's say New York. New York's a bit of a bad example because they also have a housing crisis, but. You can fit a lot more people. Because real estate is really expensive. In yes, it is. But also, I think like a lot of people live in New York. Huge demand. I, I yeah. think it's definitely more than the entire Sydney region area, yeah. right? So it, if we build like New York, right, we wouldn't have the same problem as New York because all our people will fit. Yeah. Now, that being said, we have, I think I read somewhere, don't quote me on this, but roughly 700,000 people uh, came into the country, right? Now, that's great. M more talent, more competition, more everything. The thing is, what that leads to is all these people need some place to live, obviously. And they, the people that are coming from overseas are coming for opportunity, right? So the people that are coming from overseas, they're coming here for opportunity. They're going to want to be near the city. They'll be happy to live in apartments because that's what Can we tell to. them that Australia is not the land of opportunity anymore? <laughs> no, please not. Should we send them a wake-up call? Yeah, but I mean, look, I mean, 50-50, right? Um. <laughs> With regards to land of opportunity, what I was trying to say is that if you look at 1970s America, right, Silicon Valley, where arguably majority of the, the, you know, the biggest companies are, majority of the people working in the workforce, I think three quarters of it were Indian. So when you advertise a land of opportunity and you give that opportunity, you're thinking long term and you will eventually have the big companies. You'll eventually have, um, not, I'm not saying control, but you, you will, you will have a say about how the future is going to be, right? And I think that was something America realized very early on. I think we should too. Now, the point that I was trying to make with the 700,000 people coming is like 20 something million people in, in, um, in Australia. Right? So that's a very big percentage of, of, of people coming in. And we aren't expanding infrastructure at the same rate which is once again if we build a high-speed railway or more infrastructure whatever that may be you will also be solving the problem because it's going to be let's say a half a million or seven hundred thousand for a lot of years to come because people are realizing australia is a great place to live like it's it's a it's a family oriented place um you know we, we have we probably have more holidays than we you know yeah, sometimes days. it gives you a tree and two but no, <laughs> that's like it's yeah. a give and take but tell me something. You are at twenty years old. Yeah, a student. You finish off your finishing off your degree this year. Yeah. Um. You should. You must have expectation from the government and mm. from work or work around you. Like, mm -hmm. are you getting the support that you need? Like from your generation, mm. how do you see it? Okay, from my generation as a whole, um, I think it's a bit hard to say because, as I said, a lot of people don't really know what they want to do which is fine because you're young um with the people who do know what they want to do if you're in something like mining then yes there is support if you're in something like a phd then yes there is support because you know that's done on a with a sort of partnership with the private industry um when you talk about space everyone who i've talked to in the space industry is saying it's on a it's on a downtrend and it's probably not going to come back up and then they signed the tsa agreement with with America, uh, which basically reduced our, let's say, rocket and heavy infrastructure um, capabilities to that of just renting out concrete pads. Because, you know, if you go to America, which already is a land of opportunity, right, um, for just one successful prototype, you know, companies can bring in 200, 300 million and develop the next iteration for years. And that's what ChatGPT was. So is right? Australia the wrong country for you from, like, just to meet your dreams? Do you just, like, yeah. do you do you see yourself migrating to the States down right. the track if you want to follow up your dreams or? Yeah, look, if, if I had a crystal ball, I, <laughs> I I probably would have an answer for this. But um, honestly, m my perspective on this is if somewhere isn't correct, don't run away, right? You should, you should stay there to fix it. Clearly, cl clearly there's an issue and you need to spend time, resources and energy into fixing it. Because for example, right, let's say, let's say you're a primary school student and you're doing a test and you get a question wrong, right? When you get a question wrong, you spend more time, more energy into understanding how you got it wrong and how you can get it correct. 
right? It's it's not like you get a question wrong. You know, okay, I got it wrong. I won't look at it, right? Or I'll 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 go do some other subject. So I think it's important to to stay where you are currently because you have the native advantage of it anyways. You know, culturally speaking, um, also the people wise speaking, network wise speaking, and I think and also a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that. There aren't ambitious people in Australia. There are very ambitious people in Australia, and most of them know each other. And I think something I mentioned pre- previously as well is that young people, my generation, we have grown up in a time where change was like almost instantaneous, 100%. right? With social media, with one tweet blowing things out, and then you had COVID, which played a major role. <laughs> which, like. Exactly, which which then made it even more, uh, even more fast paced because everyone's online now. So I think saying that, um. That is the country a right place currently? It's not. There are several things we can do better. Because if we were doing them well, then things like space wouldn't be on the downtrend, right? There would be like it's like it is in America, like it is in UK, it would be on the uptrend, right? But um, and I was I was talking to you know a quite a uh, a high ranking official in the government industry, and he was like, look, all of the benefits that you would get geographically, politically speaking. Um, in terms of launching a rocket or heavy infrastructure, this probably gets much outweighed by the amount of red tape uh, there is in this country for these particular things, right? I mean, f- forget about rockets. Well, let's talk about houses for a second, right? Yeah. To get to get a housing approval here, um, it takes almost a hundred days. In places like Texas, it takes seven, right? Why wouldn't a place like Texas progress faster? It will, right? So I think we need to maybe like the country needs to maybe sit down and think about what it is we can do significantly better and a lot of it has to do with the red tape obviously policy should be in place for everyone's safety but i think we need a reevaluation about how we're going to bring these things or ideas or innovations to life quicker and most of that revolves around bringing a culture like silicon valley right where if you have a prototype Right, that they works. tried it in Riot once, and and oh, failed yeah? dramatically. Yeah, well, look, failures are prone to happen. I'm not saying failures won't. In fact, if if you look at America, you have had more unicorn startups that are above billion dollars fail. Yeah, but you have had so many companies that haven't failed that now have almost a complete grip control of the world. Right. So really, if I want to just classify your concerns and mm-hmm. worries, you as the new generation, you're going to be the future leaders. Mm-hmm. Like you guys, were just on. Uh, give, you will have the opportunity just to own this land, drive, mm. grow, or maybe destroy it. We don't actually know yet. <laughs> yeah, so there's, there's so mm. many options. Yeah. What are your main concerns now? Like as a 20 years old, mm-hmm. like do you guys talk between each other? Do you have a hundred percent? Yeah. hundred. So what is your common concern and worries? Uh, common concerns and worries is always infrastructure, especially in my friend group. Um, and, you know, I, I've had the blessing of meeting a lot of people. So I know people in industry who are old, people who are, you know, g- getting towards there. Um, or, and I also have a lot of uni kids, right? All of the uni kids, a lot of the time, what we talk about is how we can make the country better and what's wrong. And or we brainstorm, you know, a, little, a lot of the times if we're empty, me and my friends will sit down and think, you know, what do you think about this? How do you think we can fix it? And we, and we sit there. And for example, the high high speed railway transportation was something that you know we brainstormed together, thinking about it just one afternoon. We were like, "Is it really a housing crisis, right? What other is there any other way we can solve it apart from just you know have to build out without good infrastructure, right?" So, and part of that reason is because we have we have grown in an environment where we are accessible to the world's problems, right? Things like climate change are taught from like second grade now. Right. I, I, when I was in second grade, I wasn't learning about climate change. Right. But because we were told about it outside through social media, yep. it's now come into a very pivotal role in the education system. Um, people are thinking about much earlier on what they want to do, how they want to do. And I think that's mainly thanks to the internet because we have so much information available to us in a very wide array of subjects. So how do you guys see the future of Australia? How do we see it? How do you see it? Really? Is it the is it going to be still an island somewhere in the middle of nowhere um, that people just have little knowledge about? Mm. Is it going to be part of Asia and then the Asians will come and occupy it and then just yeah game over? Or 
Look, you talk about this stuff. A hundred percent. We talk about a lot of things. And I think that that's something that maybe was not as commonly talked about in previous generations because the only information you had accessible was the news. So everyone would talk about the same things. We still have the news, but we also have the internet that makes us think about a lot of things. And I think the common theme that comes out is that there are issues that we need to fix, but you know, we're, we're, but we are already doing a lot of things very well, right? Like we have one of the, we have a very low crime rate. We have a great, uh, well, some would say a great education system, right? Or at least access to education is yeah, b- borderline free. Yes. It is borderline free for all. Um, heck, sure, you have to pay it out of tax. Um, but so there are a lot of things this country does very well. And there's a reason why I love this country so much, right? Because I have I also didn't travel to a lot of places outside of Australia well, with my mother and father. So I realized how the rest of the world looks like. I've had that perspective from a young age. And so there are things that I'm very thankful for in this country, and I would like to keep it that way. But then when it comes to the point of innovation, I think that's where we're really struggling. And But in the new generation, I think we're addressing it at a very core cool level, and we're always talking about it. And I think the older we get, the more the more action we'll take to fix it. Okay, so what is your real view about um, the older generation? My people like me and people older than me. Well, do you think we are losers? We no, didn't no, do no. like <laughs> much for this land, or you're gonna do it better? Because obviously you're young, you're motivated. Yeah. Look, I think my there's a saying in my family, right? The previous generation always has to. Uh, sorry, the new generation always has to be better than the previous generation. It's the only way we grow. Because think about it, even if one generation comes who's worse, then we're not growing. And so far, we have only grown as humans. We have all this, you know, tech, we have vehicles, we have planes. You know, 70 years ago, planes were very hard to come by, right? And like in the 1940s, uh, commercial airliners were just starting, right? So we live a very good quality of life. And that's obviously thanks to you guys. I think the next frontier is a very big one and i think the older generation is a lot of them are quite wise but a lot of them are running out of energy right and and i see it and i talk to people's parents and they're like you know we've been working almost non-stop for 30 40 years this is what we have achieved we're more than happy with it but on the flip side there are people who realize this and who want to work with young people i've met a lot of you know very talented very wise even some quite wealthy people and like look there's a reason we work with young people because we we know they have the energy that we don't right and so it sort of becomes this work together way that old people have the wisdom and they see what works they see what don't young people have the energy and we use that and we fix problems and it's the same thing in my um in in man in man industry space exploration half of the people are way older than me right it's not a bunch of 20 year olds right like i, I can quote three MBAs who are at least 40 or 50, right? As well as people who want to come on board, ex-CEOs of you know, billion dollar corporations who also want to come on board. They're, you know, 40, 50, 60. So old people, like, I shouldn't say old people, but the previous generation. Now you can say old people, you're <laughs> comfortable in saying old people. Yeah, but like, you, you guys have done a lot of things very well. And so firstly, I, w- I would like to say thank you because the only reason we can think, the new generation can even think about problems like space, problems like climate, uh, climate, uh, cl- climate change, and to think about all these modern day solutions is because we have we live in a place that allows us to. A lot of places currently don't. You know, hundred percent, right? Like if if I quote Afghanistan for right now, right? I'm pretty sure nobody can elect a female politician there. Yeah, you currently. can't pick the worst ever country. Now. Yeah, no, no worst Finland ever. But or... still, no, but still, what I'm saying is because a lot of the cards were played right by the previous generation, we are in a position to now take the torch forward. Okay, let me put you on the spot. Now, obviously, okay. if I talk to your dad, I haven't met your dad, but if I talk to him and <laughs> say, oh, I've got this kid, he doesn't talk to me. He's always in silos. His yeah. life is different. We can't communicate between each other. Yeah. How can we bridge this gap between the old and the new generation? How, oh, can we bridge any gap or let's leave it like this? Yeah, look. Um, so obviously the distance yeah. is becoming further and further. No, you don't talk to us anymore. You just well, hey, talk, I'm, to I'm talking to you. Yeah, well, <laughs> thank you. <Yeah. laughs> That's really nice of you. But you talk to your computers. You have yeah. your own words, virtual, non-virtual, but it's just silos. Mm. I'm not sure what you call yourself <laughs> these days. But no one talks to anyone at all. Right. Even communication is at the minimum. 
Mm. Yeah. Look, I think when it comes to a family on family basis, it may you know depend on the family. I mean, obviously, I I talk to my parents um almost every day. No, I'm pretty sure every day actually. <laughs> so it's like there is there obviously is communication, and when you talk about bridging a gap, the only possible way you can do that is also by communication, right? Um, I think access is when you come to like the corporate realm. I think access is a bit harder. Like a lot of the smart Pre- in, people in the previous generation don't have access to the talented youth, right? Or the youth with a lot of energy and ambition. And so there's a very big gap. So then what the youth start doing is they start doing things by themselves. And that's when they start to become quote unquote l- like lone wolves, right? I think if there was a bit more access between, you know, wise people from the older generation and young people with energy from the newer generation, that's pretty much the o- only possible way you can bridge it. And, but, once again, social social media is a very good place for that. Although the older generation aren't, you know, that prone to social media because they didn't grow up with it. Um, but uh, once again, so f- but I think that's primarily the responsibility of young people. You know, put yourself in a place where you get noticed. Put yourself but in a place where you're progressing. Don't you feel like young people they have a lot of worries? They have a lot of concerns. They're planning the future. They want to yeah. do stuff differently. Um, they're too busy building their life. While the old generation is just simply sitting, sitting back, man. Yeah, yeah. Just doing absolutely nothing just to bridge this gap. Yeah. They don't even reach out to you guys. I don't think they do. Mm, no, no. Like, the old, people from the older generation don't really typically reach out. Um, it's more sort of the, the, young, the young people's, you know, um, their own initiative that gets them in their places. But, but honestly, I think I w- what I would like to say is that it is the responsibility of the young people. Yeah. Right. Like to think the opportunity will come to you is a bit, um, is, is, is a bit lazy. Right. And when you work for it is when you understand and when you get the wisdom, right. Cause the point is the old generation will, uh, will become older, but the young generation will become old. Yeah. Right. So we, because if we don't do these things, if we don't reach out, if we don't, you know, because if we don't practice what we have to say, if we don't formulate idea, if we don't build on it, then we will never become wise. Yeah, yeah. look, I, I have to disagree with you. I <laughs> really? never blame the young generation whatsoever. I always blame the old generation because I've heard it so many times and yeah. we've been through it. Because the way they look at you guys, and hopefully that's not generic, but that's mm-hmm. how it is. We've done it the hard way. We mm-hmm. learned it the hard way. Yeah. It was really tough for us. Let them struggle too. Mm. Instead of... um. I've done whatever I've done just to open doors for my kids, improve their life, mm. and so they can progress in their, yeah. in their life. You mentioned education in Australia. You happy with education in Australia, you said? Standard-wise? Um, for high school or primary? High school, or? primary, yeah. uni, overall. Yeah, What's look, your perception on that? Overall, I think competition uh, will dictate the level of education. Um in my time, Australia was mostly empty. Not too many people were immigrating. That's changing a lot. Like I was driving by my previous pr- primary school the other day. We had like four or five small demountable buildings um, and just one hall, right? Yeah. Now I went there and it's like they have five-story buildings everywhere you go. There's no playground, right? So in terms of level of education, it will get the better. But also I think as you get to uni, it does become more of a business than of education. Like the amount of times I've walked into a, a class and they've put on some YouTube video explaining it to me, you know, like I'm paying, like I'm paying cause I want to learn, you, you know, the professor's perspective or the tutor's perspective or whoever's perspective. And they're showing me a YouTube video. I could, I could do that myself. Yeah. Right. So I think. So it, really your expectation is, is more than whatever you're getting now. Yes. To some to, extent. To a point. Now, obviously this is, I do computer science, right? I can't speak for all, all, all facets, but also like the really innovative um, degrees or subjects, right? If you go to American unis, right? Whatever they have in the private industry, will within a year or a year and a half be in the classrooms, right? That's not the case in Australia. Australia, by the time they develop an actual actual yeah. curriculum and course, it, private industry is five years ahead. And I've, and I've talked to young people actually who have, you know, done internships. Yeah, there's five years delay in everything. Yeah, yeah. Australia, and regardless. Yeah, no, they, um, it was a, it was an engineer. He went from uni who told him a particular software, I'm forgetting off the top of my head, 
but a particular software they were told to use in the engineering class I was like this is the best industry uses he went into industry a big firm like we used that 15 years ago right here are six new ones learn them now so there is a very big gap in what's happening in the industry and what's happening in our classrooms but that's where the internet comes in right you can bridge it by learning right like i i haven't been taught <laughs> rocket science yeah, as you know, say like we as parents the, re yeah. the only reason we sent you to the best school and we yeah. pay all of mm -hmm. this amount of money on you guys and education yeah that's true. and we work like day and night just to yeah. make sure that you guys will get the best education yeah is for this institutes to give you the best education and not just push it back on you and yeah. just put more pressure on you oh you have to do it through youtube it's all up to you and yeah whatever they just try to convince true. everyone with well yeah so f from that perspective there's a very big lack i i remember one of my first quantum subjects i went in it was a foundation subject right so they should be teaching you the rules but i walk in and they go okay this is all self-learning i'm like what <laughs> <laughs> right, this is a foundation for quantum quantum information science yeah. and i'm just doing it all by myself like, yep if you have any questions yeah you can ask it in class yeah, they're too busy and they're doing something else i'm not sure what yeah. but let's change the talk now <laughs> enough of education yeah. um are you guys interested in the global issues Honestly. politics overall do you understand the like the influence of political changes that's happening around the globe in australia down the track or you don't really care no really? no we really care i think it's quite quite the opposite you know we i remember in my grade seven class in class we were watching the live debates during science class we were watching debates between trump and hillary the active voting process so as i said we've been very involved from the young age in global politics how it affects us which different parties are going to implement which different policies and is it going to benefit or not benefit australia Right, like, and for example, when I mentioned the Australia and US signing a TSA agreement, um, that that was one of the primary concerns that you know we talk about in the young generation. It's like we're already so far behind in technology. Now you give American companies the benefit that Australian companies have. Well, now we're completely useless, right? Because American companies can get a lot of a lot of funding very quickly, mm. right? And for a long time without showing a profit which is what ChatGPT was, you know, seven years, they put in hundreds of millions, right, with no avail. And then it gets released, I think, last year. And now, you know, they're a multi-billion dollar corporation. Yeah. Americans can, can, the culture there is to do that, you know, seven, eight, nine years, do not make a profit or a single cent, put almost a billion dollars into a company, and then suddenly see this company make profit, but they're willing to stick it out. Yeah, in Australia, it's what's in it for me. Yeah. Every time you open a discussion with anyone, it's like, what's in it for me straight away. 100%. They won't even give it a go. But, um, so that's, that's really good. We talk about politics. We did the fly. Uh, we came back to earth. We mm. talk about everything. Let's go back to your route. Finally, you, oh, yeah. you came from India or no, originally, born originally raised. sorry, a born and raised, born and raised yeah. in Australia, Australia but you've got a heritage an Indian heritage. Yes. Um, do you think Australian Australians overall, like the other Australian, not the Indian culture or whatever, <laughs> yeah. understand your culture enough? Um, Do I mean, you understand your culture? Yeah, it's, it's something I was going to say. I've, I mean, even I don't understand my culture enough, you know. So I think f to expect that of others is a bit uh, is a bit short sighted of me. But um, honestly, we don't have to understand other other people's culture because if you come here. You know, you're coming here for a much better quality of life. Yeah. Right. Because, like, if that's it, your expectation, yeah. 100%. Yeah. Right. And so, when you leave where you came from to come here to live, to contribute to this society, you're going to, like, you're going to want to fix the issues here. You're going to want, like, you want to integrate into part of the culture here. Right. And I see, I, I see, this is a, one thing in the young generation where they go, oh, yes, I'm, I'm an Australian citizen. Oh, uh, but I'm actually from here. I'm like, well, what does that mean? They're like, oh, we were born and raised here, but I'm, I mean, I'm from the other country. So why they don't belong? Why they don't feel this sense of belonging? Even with my kids, yeah. they don't, they, they will tell you exactly the same story. Yeah. Even they were raised, <laughs> born in Australia. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, I think it's, I think it's a bit of short sightedness. I think we're young. We want to be rebellious. We want to say we're not the same thing. Um, but in, in, in reality, we are like, if, if 
to put in perspective, if I go to India and I overstay my visit, they're going to throw me out. They're going to say, go back to Australia. So to say I'm Indian is a bit, you know, like, yes, I have Indian heritage. Sure, everyone has a different heritage, right? Um, even, even the uh, Australians who were, you know, here originally, even they have a different heritage, you know? So I think. So do you think there will be an invasion of Indians to Australia again? <laughs> an Indian invasions? Um, I wish you would call it an invasion. You're going to be, they will be competing even with you. You oh, and honestly, I want the competition because without, without competition, there's no progress, right? One of the reasons why USC has progressed so much is because of the cutthroat competition they have, right? I mean, it's it's something we need, right? If there's no competition, then we'd all be relaxed, right? Okay, it's okay. There's there's there's, there's like yeah, but well, you actually issue. skip your job, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not well, someone <laughs> coming from nowhere and just but, stealing your job, yeah, but. Here's the thing. If someone's coming and stealing your job, they have to be more capable or they're working more hours. They're doing something different. Or they're getting uh, less money. It's, maybe, yeah. maybe, right? Something like that. But I think that then incentivize people to think about, okay, what is it I actually want to do? What is it I need to do? And sort of marry those things into each other. Now, I guess if you have kids, it's a bit of a different thing. You have bills you need to pay. You can't skip on them. You can't take, you know, huge risks. So then the only option you have is to spend more energy. You know, you have kids and, and then you do, and then you do what you want to on the side. Um, the young, the young generation to the people who are young, whenever they ask me, you know, what should I do? I say, whatever you do, take a risk now, right? Cause it, even if it doesn't go well, the price for it's not that big, right? Once you have kids, once you have all these things, you can't take these risks, right? So cause if, cause if you take this risk, then, you know, your kids are going hungry and there's no way you're doing that, right? So, so take the risk. Um, but also, whatever idea you have, try and do like a proof of concept or something, you know, try and show the world it's possible because ideas are great. Young people have a lot of ideas. One of the common things I see as well, the young people are like, oh, I have so many ideas, but I just, I just can't act on it. Right. And no one listen to them. Yeah. And, and, and when, you know, when they want to, as you said, nobody hears them out. But I think that's where you have to find similar people, you know, people who are just as ambitious as you, who are young and you can pull your resources together. 100%. Right. Look, the idea we started this Brain Splat podcast is yeah. to, to actually bridge the gap mm. between not young and old, but more between people who deal with technology and people who use technology. Yeah. And I've been in this industry for, I don't know, 25 years. Mm. Even like my kids never knew what I was doing <laughs> specifically. Yeah. I tried to explain so many times to my wife. She got it after 10 years. But right. that's how it is. And it's not just me. There's always a language that we talk that normal people don't actually understand. Right. So this is the whole idea of brain the brain splat and yeah. how we can bridge the gap. And hopefully with brain splat too, our focus just moving forward is on the new generation, on the new mm -hmm. kids, on people who are really just trying to do as much as they can. Right. Not to improve on their life, on their own life, but on the life of society that they're yeah. living in and the future of Australia overall. And I believe that you're going to be one of the best leaders in the future. Hopefully I'm not wrong. Hopefully you don't <laughs> fail me. Yes. Um, a final say, I would say a few words to your mom and dad. You should be really proud of this kid. <laughs> He's doing really well. He's very impressive. Uh, and hopefully he will stay like this. Mm, okay. Now the final say is for you, Samra. What would you say to your family overall? What would you say to everyone else and your your advice to them, even if you are young? Yeah, well, obviously my family, thank you for having me. You know, <laughs> um, uh, that was a very important part of the process. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, if anything, I would I would tell the young people of the generation to be more like my parents, I guess, you know, inspire. Act to inspire, say to inspire. Why Why wouldn't you want to do something that hasn't been done before? Right. That's the only way things are going to improve. And young people, they need to be out there more often. You'll have to pull your resources. You know, you'll have to pull a sleepless night. But that's okay. As long as, long as you have an idea and as long as you're putting yourself in the right positions, there's no reason it won't work for you. Right. 100%. And and so that's something I've done from the beginning. That's how I've gotten into this seat, you know? Um and yeah, so so young people like Try it. Don't genuinely. be shy of failing because yes. everyone fails. And don't half-ass it. Good. Uh, if, if, you, if you're going to do it, 
you know, spend 15 hours a day doing so it. don't be in the B, B plus. Yeah, Just no. aim for the A pluses, yeah? Uh, well, I mean, I was always a B kid, but sure. <laughs> but yeah. And, Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Good track time. Just give us your honest opinion about yeah. brain splat and how you felt during the process. Yeah. I mean, man, honestly, your questions were good. They were, they were very widespread. I like that because I think in a similar manner, you know, in a very abstract way. Because although it seems like these things don't relate, but they all do. And I think your podcast really, you know, really emphasizes that, you know, it takes a lot of different elements, you know, from space, housing, all these things and relates it in a very concise way, in a good way, which is why the, you know, the hour went by so quick. I you recommend Brain Splat podcast to the young, to the young generation. Oh, hundred percent, you know, and I think because the most important thing is before you do any action, you have to actually think about every stage. And I think speaking about it is the best way, you know, and in conversation, that's when you realize the shortfall and, you know, the place you're doing well. So I think a hundred percent, it will, it will get young people thinking in a lot of, in, in a lot of different ways. So I, re I recommend broadcasting to the younger generation. I think more of them should be on brain splat. Um, Hey, maybe one day you have like two or three, you know, people. It's like a conversation. I'm having one next week. So oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah, but I, I think, I think with that, you know, with a lot of different people in different fields, I think that could be interesting. Like a, like a Nobel Prize roundtable. Hundred percent. You know how they have those. Hundred percent. Yeah. Look, all the best in your future. I'm sure that you'll succeed. That's my gut feeling. Don't give up, mm. and uh, make sure you don't. If you hit a brick wall in front of you don't keep on hitting this wall yeah, yeah. don't do not do that mm -hmm. change your direction learn from it and you know try to just cross as many bridges as you can mm -hmm. in your life and don't let anyone stop you brain splat podcast behind the scenes also are we speaking to this mic or this mic no i just stop just be stuck to me don't talk to anyone. Don't talk to your hidden friend. Also, hidden friend. Are we all good? Samra? Yes. Yeah. Welcome to Brain Spot. Thank you. I'm good. You can't hear. Yeah, it's fine. We can lock it. I'm used to it. <laughs> oh yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> How many offices did you guys have on so far in total? Uh So who are you really? Like, who are you? Who is, where do you come from? What's your background? Your family? Okay, well, my parents are Indian, so they immigrated here. I'm Australian, born and raised, Australian citizen. Who am I? I think I'm just a guy interested in science. Honestly, I think there's a lot of potential for it in the country, and I just wanna, I just wanna see that realized. What does your family do? So my mother, she's currently a lecturer at uni. Uh, my father, he's in IT, but he, he loves, like, he's a passion for film and documentary. Um, so he's going in his own direction with that now. Uh, yeah, and, and my mom, she used to work for places like Nokia in the early days, like 010, where they were, uh, were using satellites and creating all sorts, sorts of mapping systems. Um, she was like ahead of the, the APAC team. So I was always exposed to technology early on. Mm. And you know, I think that that lit a fire in me that still, that still hasn't gone. So, what is this fire in you? Like, what is your plan now? What are you working on? Right. So, currently, right now, what we're working on uh, is Martian cement. The reason being is because everyone's thinking, okay, we're going to go to Mars, we're going to do this, but it's like, how do we actually stay there? How do we form a? Thank you. Thank you. How like how do we form a? self-sustaining civilization, what they say, but all the work that's been done is only on rockets. So we're looking at the other end. We're like, okay, let's say we have a rocket on Mars. What are the things we need to survive there? And we're building that now. And so currently right now, it's basically Martian cement. So it's like aggregate and rocks that are available in the Martian soil. Um, 
put them together with cement made from local materials. And we're trying to see how we can make so it into... Where did you get this passion from? Why space. Why? Yeah, space. Well, I mean, parents, obviously, you know, when you're small, a lot, a lot of the things you do are with your parents. Um, they took me to NASA once. I think I was grade 9, grade 10. And I think then when I saw what like NASA was doing, I'm like, we need this in Australia. You must have been an expensive trip. Oh, 100%. <laughs> my, my parents did not want to spend that much.